Next up is Very good. Next up is Mr. Jason Scott. He has an update on the Internet Archive. Like that. Oh, so much better. Awesome. Always check everything. Nothing will go right. Remember the slogan of the Kansas Fest AV team, you had to be there. <laughs> anyway, so, hi, I'm Jason Scott. Uh, this is called What a Difference Every Year Makes. It's just an update for the work I do, for the institution I do, along with some generalized thoughts quickly veering into a black hole maelstrom of theoretical outlook towards future because that's what I do. Um, some p how many people here have no idea who the heck I am? You're just here, this is your thing. Okay, that's what I figured. Um, so this is a meme from shrimp farming communities. And um, the reason I'm just mentioning is because every community has its own very specific aspects and its own pieces and its own in-jokes and its own memes. And so never get hung up. My advice to anybody who's in any small community is just never get hung up on this and that and think that it, this is some unique high or low, because we've all got our interests in this world, and we're all trying to get by, and we're all having a good time. Anyway, so my name's Jason. This is me when I'm like 16 years old, and that's me when I was 25 years old, and that's me when I was 28 years old. That's me when I was 35 years old. Uh, this is me when I'm 38 years old. This is me now. So um, I've just done a whole bunch of stuff involving archiving and history and pieces and things like that. So I, I'm, I'm always involved. Uh, in, if there's any theme to my life, it's been that I take a lot of um, weight in our cultural history, primarily digital, and preserving as much of it as possible for others to regard, laugh at, learn from, and, and otherwise do it. And I've noticed over and over again that it only takes the effort of a few small individuals to be critical in keeping things around. It can be the difference between one person looking at a pile of boxes and saying, maybe we should take this home before they knock this building down. And that's the difference between why we know this movie was ever made or why this project was ever done. So sometimes it can feel very lonely when other people tell you things are junk uh, or that they're not relevant. And then later you find out that you were the savior of an entire cultural piece. This has been something I've learned over and over again. Um, last year, I was in this car in Austria. Uh, the reason I was in there was because I was shooting a movie. Um, so I'm in my first fictional movie, professional movie uh, acting. I look like this in the movie. Um, that's my partner, Rachel, who I never talk about because I like to protect people who are near me, but that's Rachel and she's more than happy to be with me and she is my everything. Um, I work for this dump, it's called archive.org. Uh, this is how most people see it on the front page. This is actually what it looks like. Um, it's a crazy building that my boss, who has a lot of money from dot-com stuff, said he wanted to buy a building that looked like his logo. It has no functional reason to exist like it does, but we're there. And in there are a whole variety of glorious online pieces. Most people know it as the Wayback Machine. That's well over half of our traffic. And so most folks use us to look at Yahoo in 1999 or to verify somebody said something they claimed they didn't or to be able to find their own embarrassing part of childhood that they thought was gone. Um, anyway, primarily what's interesting me these days is turning the physical into the digital. Uh, taking things that people don't consider valuable and turning them digital. Uh, that goes across a whole bunch of medium, but for the purposes of this crowd, it is five and a quarter and three and a half inch floppy disks. And I have been living that life at full speed in the last couple years. Um, so I have been donated lots and lots of properties. Here's the Corpus Christi Apple Users Group uh, stuff in 1986 that was just sent to me in a big box. Because the narrative for folks is they want to keep things and then when they get to a certain point, be told that it was good they did this and that they do not have some sort of disease. <laughs> and so 
I'm there to give them that final dun dun before they throw it out to say, you know what? A museum, a nonprofit, a library wants your stuff. You've done good, warrior. You may rest. You can have that closet, that basement, that attic left to your own devices now, knowing that it was the, the scene of a, of a saintly act. So people have been sending me the final chapter of their keeping of old material, especially, like I said, floppy disks. I love getting floppy disks. And the thing is, it's one thing to have the floppy disks. And I've scanned sleeves. I've scanned in labels. I have transcribed many handwritten things. Um, and put them online. So, you know, it's the same thing behind it as in front. The white window are the disk images of what's in that little bin, and the black window in the back is me transferring them from my home machine up into the Internet Archive stacks. So at this moment, it exists in three physical locations and two different media. And again, it is 100% content agnostic. I have long ago moved away from having favorites of saying, well, this is a Broderbund, this is obviously valuable, this is a handwritten thing that says plot test Mr. Lee's teacher disc and saying this is not valuable. To me, it is all valuable. My job is not to be the gatekeeper. I don't want to be cursed out in 2030. I mean, I'm going to be cursed out in 2030, but not for that. This is one of my typical boxes. Um, so the software collection for people who wonder goes into a shipping container inside of a warehouse each one of those is um uh, five feet by five feet by five feet i have 21 of them and it's of software and books and so that's where it all goes it's gone from here and from many other locations uh then i try to make them live again because i believe that entire realms of physical material turned into digital is just another form of that. So this is the logo of what's now called the emularity. The emularity is that thing where you go to the archive, there's a little logo, and it boots an Apple II in a window. Which, as I predicted, and I'm very happy that my prediction came true, went from miraculous to banal horse crap in about two years. The, 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 po the pros and cons, the fact that it's a little bit hard on older boxes, that it's a little scratchy on some machines, that there's no way to put a second disc in quite yet, and that needs to be repaired and upgraded, was about a year um, from, oh my God, to uh, this thing. It functions and continues to function as the critical preview to me of this material we're doing. The ability to instantly look at the thing we're looking at without turning up a whole process. I was incredibly happy to see NetDisk. How many people here were not here for the NetDisk announcement in the new products announcement? Uh, so basically, this wondrous piece of work takes a URL of a disk image on an Apple II GS, you click on it, and it is now a mounted disk on your desktop, utilizing an Ethernet connection a completely insane from space uh, operating system upgrade. And it will then allow you, that's neat, but then it will allow you to do a search on the Internet Archive for a title. So your library on your Apple II GS just expanded up by tens of thousands of disks, none of which cost you any time. Um, I know that there are other plugins out there. All right. I theoretically have no idea what two people are talking about, but I have heard rumors of modules that click into the massive stores of the Internet Archive and create downloadable menus, downloadable works, enabling you on your set-top box or your home computer to just have the world's largest software library and just function in it. This is perfectly fine from my point of view, uh, Your Honor. The <laughs> place is completely available to be used as a storehouse, it does not have to be the gatekeep. You don't have to have our cute little format and our piece and what all that means. You're fully capable of using it uh, however you wish. That was part of the dream, um, not limiting. Um, I continue to have the debate of why are you not in jail. It's boring, but I understand it. Um, the amount of companies from the Apple II community who have tried to punch my lights out has been happily small, happily small. First Star Software really likes Boulder Dash. 
And the reason why is because it's still a mobile app. So they have now sold uh, for anybody for anybody who didn't have it immediately go off on their pager when this news hit. First Star Software has sold their back catalog to a mobile company uh, in the last year. So Spy vs. Spy, Astro Chase, Boulder Dash, and the other one I've never heard of have been sold to a mobile company. This either means that Astro Chase comes to your phone or nothing. I'm not sure. Funny fact, I used to live one mile from First Star Software. I don't know. I don't know how that happened. But they were more than happy to call me to tell me to take down Boulder Dash. On the other hand, there is currently a massive Boulder Dash collection on the Internet Archive. The other one is Epix. Um, it, I don't know how many people know this, but a Bible software company owns Epix. And the reason I even know that was because I had an altercation with another entity who claimed that they owned the ability of a certain platform to boot an entire type of computer. And I said, that is objectively ludicrous. And they said, we don't think it's ludicrous. And we went, well, we do think it's ludicrous. And they went, yeah. And that's about where it stood. But on the way out, he went off and told the Bible software company that their precious Summer Games 2 was sitting around earning untold sums of money at this library. So, so anyway, Summer Games 2, Jumpman and all that are technically owned by a company that I can assure you does not care. Like a, like a, like a baron who just found out in his 12th year that he owns a golf club. Like no connection to it whatsoever, but they sent me a letter and so it's down. Anyway, don't put Summer Games 2 on your website, I guess. Anyway, so... That's been about it, though. That's nothing compared to many of these others. Uh, Atari and I, and Basis, uh, Capcom and I are not sending each other any Christmas notes anytime soon. <laughs> Nintendo. And there's you know, lots of other places who have all varying degrees of belief of what a library is and what we should do. There's currently a war being fought on the librarian scale. It's no secret, except for people who think it's a secret, that like publishers hate libraries. Like Publishers really hate libraries. And uh, they hate them more and more each time. They've just started to embargo ebooks. So what that means is that most of the big names now are doing what they used to do the videotapes, which is they will not sell an ebook to a library. They had an usurious cost before for libraries, where they were literally charging like a hundred dollars for Fifty Shades of Grey plus each down each use for two weeks for X amount. Um, and now they won't even let those libraries have the ebooks for eight months after publication. So there's a war being fought. I'm with a really weird side. We are the bizarre freemen of the, the distant realms of the library because we're funded privately. But that's going on out there. Anyway, all that matters to you is there's lots of cool crap out there. So cool crap is stuff like this where I am grabbing all of these old junk mails and having them scanned and there's a site called the Ted Nelson junk mail folder that is just full of all of these incredible realms of old 60s, 70s, 80s computer technology engineering and, and there's just so much story and aesthetic here. You, you know, each page is like a brand new realm of like, what were we thinking? Um, and you know, and of course for some people here, they're like, oh, my old, my old Hitachi. But um, for most people, it's like, oh my God, this is from space. But I'm mostly here for this little guy. Um, and, and this little guy. When I'm trying to explain to people like the massive expansion that happens with the Apple II and the amount of which, like this, this is still an Apple II in the same way that like V'ger is still a little satellite. Um, it is an extremely modified entity built on a framework and that, that indicates a continued lifeblood in that community and that work and that peace. Uh, the economics may not work out for everybody and they may be really weird like a, you know, it feels like a lot of our products have to be done in a potluck sort of way of like, we're all going to round up, we're going to go out, you know, posse comiteus, we're all going to go grab, each, each one's going to come running in with 150 bucks and together we're going to... We're going to make a thing that should not be, and um, we're going to buy it. But regardless, 
there aren't many other communities doing that, that level. Like some of them are replacing vital parts. You can still buy brand new I, robot, and um, uh, the other one by the same guy, quantum uh, uh, um, controllers, these unique one-of-a-kind controllers, and they have to machine them and sell them for $85 a piece. So that there's some of that in other places, but I don't know. I think this place is the king. Uh, again, still love everything about the concept of the entity of the Apple II. What's important to me, I'm in a lot of places, again, think shrimp farming, but I'm delighted by the fact that we have done a top-up job of preserving the physical, technical, personal, and cultural context of the Apple II computer and continue to keep it alive and revisit it. Not many communities really do that. Things become very divested and spread out and things become concepts, but there's still a very strong bond. It's, it's mostly unique. In terms of that, you can see the progress of technology in terms of turning, spinning pieces of dying mold squares into a program. And so you start out with something like this ADT, and I'm worried now that we're actually going to get to the part in the Apple II community where ADT fate falls off the map as a recognized incredible piece of work that it is. Uh, just an amazing fact of not only does it transfer disks from a regular Apple over to your piece of garbage, but it will also take itself in by attaching, you can actually take your laptop's audio out, plug it into the cassette of an Apple, and it will feed it a boot program that will then pull the rest of the program down quickly to boot it up. Like that level of bootstrapping of like, I picked this thing up just like that, upside down, underneath some baked goods at a, at a garage sale. I was able to plug something in and hook it up to one of my monitors and you can still get to this, which means you can write disks out once you get over the culture shock of what do you mean it doesn't have a disk drive. But once you do that, it'll work. So, and, in, and, you know, and he's kept it going, like it's been functionally running very well. My only problem is I am trying to slim things down. I no longer want an Apple II on my desk because I'm pulling in from so many different things and it's very bulky. So that's where we were. And we can still go back to that. It works functionally and it produces this, right? It produces a, a pile of 140K images of programs with names that can go into an emulator or an online emulator or Cider Press, which is another miraculous piece of work, which enables you to analyze and go over and regurgitate all the material. But then we get into the problem of there's more to the software experience, the packaging, the, the protection, the, 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 you know, there's like about nine different vectors of what we're looking at here, both the, the artwork and the experience along with the fact that sometimes the discs have gone through multiple sleeves. And this is something of interest. The label is of interest. It's starting to fade. Um, you know, like, so there's all these other vectors. You know, for some people, they, they just want to boot up their EasyWriter. Why? But you can do it. And to VisiCalc, the proof of VisiCalc is a very important you know, piece of software history, so you want to do it. So this, this is an experience that ADT can't do. And so it, it can pull in some of it, but it really can't pull in all of it, right? So there's people out there. And what they've done is you've got this interaction with something like the applesauce. Now the applesauce, you know, the applesauce is somebody came to a knife fight with a nuclear bomb. <laughs> and it's an incredibly over-engineered piece of material for what it needs to do, which is somebody has a commodity piece of uh, uh, co you know, coalition of Japanese and California technology that has been remixed into being able to read off of this little, little piece of plastic. And it says, well, what if we attached an electron microscope to it and pulled out 20 megabytes of its data? Um, it once again proves, you know, you take long enough time, you will end up with this this, right? This is, this is an unfair advantage to the software duplicator. Um, you are aware of the full function of the disk. You can visually see what's going on. You're pulling 
from a 20 megabyte overview of it. Uh, you keep that because you're crazy and space is no object comparatively. And then you run a machine that is a million times faster than an Apple II against that pile of data to let you know that it can now boot <laughs> Apple Panic, <laughs> you know, definitively. <laughs> and then there's this, and that's a whole other debate. The concept of metadata and context. This is a, this is a, hi, John. This is a halting first step in a wayward journey that may or may not have a happy ending. But I appreciate the effort. <laughs> Whenever you're dealing with metadata, the problem is that there is a constant problem of structure booting up against other structures because there is no universal metadata format here. There are library systems, there are cataloging systems, there are scientific classification systems. They all hate each other. If you put them together, you don't get a baby. <laughs> you get two brown and black puddles. So you will always have, you know, it's more like thanks, but it's not the diff, like, uh, I don't want people to not take actions because they're terrified that they won't enter metadata correctly. I would never want somebody to not image their rare program because they're not sure if it's 83 or 84 because it says 83 or 84 on it. Or whether Sensible Software or Sensible Software Incorporated said it. Like, don't sweat it. Please don't sweat it. What's important is the data. And I'm going to go way down a hole very shortly about that. All that matters to me is there's a 20 megabyte, rid worst family photo ever, of just 20 megabytes of this poor piece of plastic that can be manipulated to the ends of time. Um, for anybody who has not interacted with this, a lot of people have, maybe they haven't, it's applesaucefdc.com. It is my current highest endorsement for imaging the Apple II. Uh, you will spend money to do it. It will cost you hundreds of dollars, but you will also be able to hook up a drive to it with some modifications and be able to produce these from your collection. No Apple II is required. It hooks up to a Macintosh. Um, and it pulls down the data and then writes it out into a format called WAS, or if it's capable, these other more non-protected versions. Um, but you should never get rid of the A2R, the original flux image. You just want what works here. The advantage of the WAS, even though it's just another format or the latest format, is that this one is much more cognizant of copy protection. And what that means is that now that all the emulators, pretty much all the emulators support it with other ones apologizing for not, as opposed to telling you to go screw that you should, um, is that it will perfectly emulate the experience of the floppy. And again, whether or not your life is one in which you ever got to see the title of the game Sabotage or not, that's up to you and your superior being, but it's good to know the option is there where before it did not. And we have a lot of programs that people thought were canonically uh, captured for all of time. And it turns out, no, they weren't. It turns out we actually didn't have digital copies that were dependable of games like Sabotage and Choplifter and so on. We had cracked versions, modified versions, versions that were stripped down, but we did not have the actual experience as it came out of the box in 1983. So, good. Life would have been fine with the cracked versions, but it's wonderful to appreciate what we have now. So, if you're somebody who's out there who's looking at this, who's like, what? Great. Um, we take all of the fluxes that are in my area of influence and I encourage people to upload them to the Internet Archive. We now currently have, I believe the current number is 12,000 individually fluxed Apple II floppies on the archive. All downloadable and viewable, but not bootable. They're just there. These are meant to be the... I have discovered, and this is the hard one thing as a eight years now at a frontline professional archivist, is a lot of people want to push you to the side during your tour to get down into the box of the real junk so they can do their real work. And I always encourage having a here's before I messed with it pile of all your data. 
so they can go do it because you're terrible because you're not them. Let them go in, let them get super hung up on the thing that they care about. Leave it there for them. Don't get in, in their way. Let them do it. And so these fluxes are here for anybody who wants to do an experiment, who wants to do research. As you can already start to surmise, there are patterns in these things. They indicate, I have watched 4AM and others look at a flux. Nothing up my sleeve and go Broderbund copy protection style. So we're already to that point that people are like, aha! Ah, that's a vintage Gustafson. Hmm. Ah, yeah. So um, we have also discovered silent versioning, which is where all the packaging says the same thing, the version says the same, but it's not. So that's happening. That, that leads to a syndrome I don't want to go into, but you should be aware that there is not a bad side to if you have the time imaging everything, even though we have it. Because sometimes we'll discover we don't have it. We're, even at this event, we've found demo versions, like stripped down demo versions of programs. It's kind of neat to see what they think. I try to bring the world into what we do. So I stream on Twitch. Uh, so I am currently Twitch's leading live streaming computer archivist. And so I'm in the, I'm in the arts and creative section. And I live stream ripping CDs and, and, and uh, floppy disks and other pieces. Try to inform what people are doing. I let Waz uh, bless it. And, um, and they watch as this works and I get hit. Twitch just incorporated something called, okay, let's go back here. Who knows what Twitch is? All right, so that's not everybody. Twitch is the latest gamer-oriented live streaming service. There have been others, but this is the one. It's currently owned by Amazon. But it basically wants you to, when you hear about gamers doing live shows, they are running, like here's them playing, and th sometimes it has their face uh, on it, and they have people chatting, and they get to give kudos, and they have ads on it, and they spend day in and day out playing, responding, and then asking for either money or for other prizes, and they build up audiences and influence and live the celebrity lifestyle for a few of them. Um, and I looked at that and said, flux capacity reading, that would be the thing to do. Nobody, know, nobody knows what to do with it. You can see the Beagle Brothers carefully watching <laughs> soon. Um, and I usually get anywhere between 100 or 200 people a day who watch me doing it. Um, and then there's this thing called raids now. And what that means is that if you're a streamer who has like people on your stream and you're going to end your stream, you can choose another stream and just shove your audience at them. So that's happening to me more. Like, I'm watching streamers who are playing games, like, and now Apple II reading, because they're not giving it to a competitor, because I'm not their competitor. <laughs> so they're like, they're basically blasting closing time from the speakers with the lights up at the end of their show. Closing time, and then Apple II imaging. <laughs> and I get these kids who are like, you know, they're, you know, they're about as old as the idea of Twitch itself, going, hey, what's this? What is, and, and remember, it's not just, whoa, is that what I think it is? It's, what is this? What is any of this? What is happening? Why? Anything. I don't get it. And then I start to explain it to them, and then they're like, that is breathtakingly odd. Like, that, just that view, right? If somebody was like, what are you doing? I'm sending fish to space. Real fish? Yeah, real fish. Space? Space? Yeah, breaks the, breaks the barrier. And then maybe I'll talk about rocket fuel, and I'll be like, rocket fuel? And they're like, awesome, wow, rocket, wait a minute, fish to space? <laughs> because they have no connection to the games, they have no connection to the history, the culture, it's meaningless to them. All they know is I'm doing something very interesting with machinery. So, and then I'll explain what we're doing and, and what we're up to, and I talk about this thing and so on, and I give pieces. And so it's an educational outreach, and it's very effective because all, a lot of this work I'm doing is kabuki theater to encourage people to know that A, there's a thing called the Apple II, uh, two, there's a, a community, three, there are things that are valuable that are part of it, and four, you might know somebody who does. And more people have come to me and said, oh, I saw the stream, or somebody told me about it, and you take old floppies, do you want 400 floppies? A question I love getting. 
I guess. <laughs> anyway, so the WAS format is the latest step. Every format thinks it's the last format. And the history of formats, I don't want to debase it by giving you my stupid summary of it. I think there's a worth, if somebody who's new here is like, what do I do? Go ahead and give a talk next year about like the history of Apple II transferred formats. Because it's, you know, it's deep and rich and there's enough people around who will crap talk about it on the Slack and go into this piece and that. And I think there's a real advantage for you there. So, free. Free for you. That one's for free. Um, so uh, this is where I get excited. Uh, Passport is now a Python program. That was announced years ago. But one of the things that does is that gets, I, I prefer to work in Unix uh, and Ubuntu working through command line interactions. I do an average of four or 5,000 transactions with the Internet Archive a day. So they need to be command line and they need to be scripted. So whenever anyone produces a beautiful graphic version of something, I'm like, that is absolutely irrelevant. And I need the thing that makes me go like this 100,000 times. And Passport will allow me to do that because it buried in Passport is the ability to take an A2R and turn it into a WAS. If it can take an A2R and turn it into a WAS, it can take anything and turn it into anything. It is able to take a reading of disk geometry, convert it, and then make a thing that boots. Like, it has to. That's what it has to do. And what we've discovered is that the, uh, the, the applesauce is so over-engineered, it doesn't care if a Commodore, Tandy, or Atari disk is put in it. It will read it with the same level of detail, and it will produce an A2R that works. My goal by next year is to have the applesauces reading Commodore, Tandy, and Atari disks to the point that I can shove in the disk and not look at the label. So that's my current plan. We'll see how that works. I have to find a programmer who's comfortable with Python and who wants to deal with the crankiest developer on earth. <laughs> and right now, so I've got this whole idea about the blorb. And I, I've been talking a little bit about the blorb People who are, uh, I have a podcast, and the podcast has me talking about the blorb. Some of this you'll know already. Um, so the blorb is me, like right now we are in a golden era of turning these plastic death squares into angelic files. But reason for that, but, 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 and we're doing it, right? And we're going at a very fast rate. Many of you have seen the pile upstairs. There are other piles. They are being pulled down very quickly. The WAS uh, format and the ability to image disks hits the world on basically May 8, 2018, maybe June, March, depending on who you are and whatever. But it's literally like w two people can do it in March, a few people can do it in May, a hundred couple people can do it in June and July. So that's where we are now and we're already at known 12,000 fluxes. So we already are there plus disks images where we didn't flux them at all because we knew tough jump, but we knew that they were not in need of being fluxed because they were pure data on the disk. Um, that is very powerful, but it also means that we are going to run out of disks because if we're running at that speed, we're going to run out of disks. And when that is, whether it's in one year, five years, or ten years, we are going to run out of disks. We will evacuate the number of people who are comfortable having these things exist. That's why I also want to go after the other formats, and we will hit this thing. At that point, we have a corpus of the experience of the human spirit portrayed 140K at a time. And what happens then? How many times can you boot sneakers? How many times can you play VisiCalc to prove what? I don't know. But that's a, you know, like that's the deep philosophical piece of what's there. What do you do with this digital piece? And I've been working on the archive now. Um, uh, it used to be the case, if you count people I've influenced and assist, I am a significant small percentage of the Internet Archive's total corpus. Like, I'm one of the petabytes. Because I have been telling everybody, come on in, bring it. 1,200 VHS tapes digitized? Sure. Piles of manuals? Bring them in. 
piles of spec sheets, radio shows, magazines, technical properties, bring them in. And as a result, there are well over a couple hundred thousand items that I'm somewhere in there on. And then they put me on spam duty. But spam duty for me quickly turned into classification duty. And classification duty is much more interesting. So I have personally moved 1.5 million items around the Internet Archive in the last year. And what that means is that I now know what's coming in and how people are interacting with it and I know what's th where that's going. And I'm very excited. And I realized that instead of thinking about individual items that people get very hung up on, have we, have we scanned them and have we put them in, I have now just declared the entire corpus of digital humanity as something I call the blorb. And the blorb does not care what anything is. To you, silly apes, this is a series of magazines, but it is also an entire packed, loaded set of Dutch computing history, Dutch publishing history, font formats, the ability of humans to read, the ability of us to transfer information, digitization process. It is like overloaded with all of this other extant information that a machine or a person manipulating a machine um, can use for all of time or until we blow ourselves up. So um, we're not going to blow each other up for like at least a few weeks. So we've got time and there are these things in here and the reason I put it here in Dutch is because I don't want you to get hung up on what he's saying it's the functionality of these pages like this is a thing to you this is how in 1982 they're expressing programs how they're doing screens and then there's this which I think was some somebody's idea in the printing process of being cool like wired but it's stupid and then here's this stuff and your brain says this means it's a program because this is a text. Why? Why is that? Why is that typewriter a thing? And then this is a typewriter, but it's a different typewriter. And it's a format. Machines don't care. What we have here is kids using an apple. And there is the part of us that is using this and wants to experience this again or wants to experiment with it and learn. But to me, there's something about the fact of the actual digital context of it's meaningless whether or not this formatted thing is anything and this is a whole bunch of signals for machine analysis we are going to head to a point where things like the apple sauce are generating massive digital files that are going into the internet archive but we are also being given other machines so um this thing which i does anybody know what this is? Yeah, this is a Domesday project reader. Um, this was, it was originally <laughs> uh, in the same way the space shuttle was created because somebody wanted to get a pizza really fast, I guess. It would be like that. There was a one project that the Brits made that was meant to be a, uh, uh, a future-proof capture of history and it was called the Domesday Project and it was saved in a ridiculous format that was stupid. So the Domesday Project within 10 years is unreadable. So one of the highlights of this embarrassment is that funding and efforts have gone to resuscitate the information from the dead formats to be able to bring it back. So this is that using commodity hardware because we're turning China into the 19th century. Uh, of industrialism and we're allowing these things to be built that are doing reading but this is to laser discs what the applesauce is to floppy disks and so when it reads it doesn't mess around it pulls in the signal and it evaluates it now you as a person see this thing you go oh video signal thank you for that but the domesday is going right down to the full signal and reading it all the way down at an incredible sample rate to the point that they can begin to notice drops and then write code to make that drop go away. So it doesn't just pull it in, it can take the raw flux and repair it, certainly for the human eye and possibly even better than that. This is what it's, this is the future. People then figured out that the Domesday project doesn't, or the Domesday machine thing doesn't care that it's a laser disc. Why not be anything? So that's when they aimed it at a video tape. And this is what came out of a videotape. So this is pulling out of a videotape an enormous amount of information, everything from the, the decoded off 
line code that's being sent along with it, being able to, which is there here being interpreted, all of the magnetic data in between at a resolution that's much, much higher because it's super sampling it, which means you can have votes to go, good, good, ah, I think we're going to go with good, which means you can theoretically produce better versions of what's being saved. So you can look at it. Um, we are now getting further and further along. And so that's why I say when you look at things like this Hitachi computer, this is very important, but I also think this is very important. That, that this is a portrayal of destruction because of mold that was on this particular document. And the concept of mold will be used both to remove mold and to add mold as we need to. And we are moving towards a place where this is the original Doom uh, texture and this is a machine assisted upscaling of that exact same file. So we are now getting to the point that machines are able to augment to our pleasure the context of everything. Well, if you can do it with video, you can do it with audio. So in the future, I think there will be a financial run on pre-copyright 1920s music because they will be able to say to a machine, take samples from 1970s songs, the experience of the room, the experience of the things, make it sound like it was recorded in a 1970s studio with the stereo and the, I think we will be there within the next five years. Um, and so in the meantime, in the meantime, we have toys. And so, for instance, there's this thing called 8-Bit Workshop. An 8-Bit Workshop enables you, among other things, to work with an Atari 2600 and program in the language with code highlighting and with the instant output, constant, constant recompiling and playing of this cartridge and then manipulating it for free right now. I believe we will see this on the, uh, on the Apple work stuff we will do. We will manipulate disks in real time. We will tell our machines to do things they're not supposed to do. We will live do it. I want some of this to come into the emularity. Other people have done it with versions of the emularity. I want the archive to do it where you can change out the sound cards. You can change out the video. You can start running it on different monitors and so on. I think we're going to get there. I'm very excited about where we're going. And so I think that I have come to love the blurb. Um, the Blorb's growing, it's flexible, it's universal, and I'm telling people to kit bash the Blorb. Do not, do not pause at the, the, the lines and special little edges we gave for ourselves at the ends of the pages and the text and the files that they were supposed to be. Start hitting them on every direction. Experiment with them, send signals through them they're not supposed to. Simulate them, modify them, turn them into filters be excited, get involved, help me find as much of the analog world to make it as digital as possible. I don't care what format it's in anymore. I don't care what's happened to it. I'm absolutely, absolutely excited and uh, full of life about it. And one other thing, uh, I wasn't feeling well in May. I couldn't figure out why. I was really annoyed. I went to the hospital. I'm like, I don't feel well. My doctor was like, yeah, you're fine. I said, no, nah, I don't believe you. I went to the emergency room. They said, you're kind of fine. I said, I don't think so. They're like, fine. They did a nuclear stress test on me and one of the arteries was 99% blocked. So that night, they opened it up. Not 100%, but 99%. Since I had my last heart attack a year and a half ago or two years before that, that tells me I do two things. I generate drama and cholesterol. <laughs> and I, I, so, so uh, one of the side effects can be morbidity, but it's more to me a realism. So one of the things I've definitely been functioning along is that I am very obviously playing a game of missile command and uh, I've still got all three cities, but it is very obvious there are a lot of missiles coming down. Uh, I'm going to be upping my, you know, my colon, uh, I'm joining the colonoscopy club. I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to get all the fun, all the fun. Uh, a few people went, yeah, I know. <laughs> Um, but I'm taking it very seriously and I have a diet that's, you know, ideal for that. But one of the things it's done for me is provide me with that clarity of just do stuff and don't get hung up on small things. So I, most of my storage is now either with the archive or with institutions. I have a very small amount of stuff that I actually keep. So none of it depends on me. 
all of my institutions, the archive team work that I do, the Internet Archive and work, is documented and is prepared for an eventuality of me not being there. It is possible for there to be a difference between not there at all and there. It is possible to be, I can't make that a priority anymore. So it has been a very evocative and interesting journey for me to take, the guy who was more than willing to drive a thousand miles round trip for a single interview. Um, and I just encourage people to take care of themselves and think about it. Uh, I have brought here, and I am keeping with me, a blood pressure cuff. I am happy to give anonymous readings. It really should be 120 over 80, and if it's not, you really need to talk to a person. You really do. I am on six medications, and none of them for my personality. So there's still something to be done, but you know, they do things to me, they make me feel better, and I encourage people to please take care of themselves because the blorb will live without you, but why give it a head start? Anyway, thank you very much. How'd I do? Uh, I, I, that was the most anemic, you're running out of time you've ever given. I didn't even see it. Yeah, I gave up. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, so um, have a break now, and uh, for and in ten, minute, ten minutes we're back for the assembly, uh, assembly uh, lightning talks. I think. Uh, yeah. So I think we probably should actually give people the break. Now. Do it. So, ten minute break. Bye bye. Bye. Oh, I'm very sorry. One more thing, one more thing, this is not really, so do you guys, okay, so I said this at the new product thing. I'm do, just like Kevin did that ridiculous experiment of reading WizKids Live. By the way, that is the num it's now the number one rated WizKids Live performance currently in the, the, the <laughs> Playbill has rated it the number one Playbill. Well, anyway, this thing I'm doing at 8 p.m. called Marathon is an experiment and it's an experiment, and I would love for you to be a part of it. It is, a, it is basically, we are going to set up five apples, and we are going to have a series of games and, they, and programs, and they have to get through them with their missions. And whoever stumbles through all nine is the victorious super winner of who knows what it's useful for. I don't know. It's a lumberyard coupon. But it's more fun if people are part of it and are part of the experience. So you don't have to do anything if you're an audience member. Just enjoy watching the fun of our Apple games. So please consider doing it. Thank you.